Hi, hey everybody. My name is Lauren Mishling, and I'm here to talk to you today about something I am very passionate about, which is complementary, integrative, holistic, natural therapies for Parkinson's disease care and management. The first thing I want to do is thank the hosts for giving me a topic as broad as they did. Um, I'm often asked to speak about the relationship between diet and Parkinson's disease progression. And it is virtually impossible to talk about food without talking about the context of complementary and alternative medicine, supplements, and other natural therapies. You will see as this course goes on, this lecture goes on, that there are a hodgepodge of complementary and alternative therapies. I could spend this entire 30 minutes just talking about the research on forest bathing or mindfulness or exercise or photobiomodulation for Parkinson's disease. Um, we're not going to touch on all of those too much. My area of expertise is in the nutrition and the diet perspective. Are there things that people with Parkinson's need to do bet to above and beyond what a non-Parkinson's person might need? Are there things that if you did a little more of this or a little bit of that may lead to improved outcomes and higher quality of life over time? As I was, uh, wrapping up my PhD dissertation, I will take a second to tell you that I had this moment where I realized I had just spent 14 years of my life and a couple hundred thousand dollars getting PhDs and MPHs and NDs and all of these degrees, um, which led me to this place where I concluded the better we sleep, the more we move, the more fresh fruits and vegetables we eat, the more friends we have, and the more financial stability we have, the better we do over time. So I'm not convinced that when you walk away from today's talk, I'm going to say anything terribly mind-blowing to any of you, but I do want to let you know that there really is an emerging body of evidence suggesting that there are some things you might be able to do today that might improve the quality of life and your Parkinson's symptoms over time. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. The figure on the left looks at what symptom reduction would look like. If we gave you a medicine that decreased your symptoms initially by 50% and you were able to maintain that benefit over the course of the rest of your life while the disease continues to progress, that's what that dotted line would show. If you look at this figure on the right, we don't see any symptomatic benefit. What we see is a decrease in the rate of pro pro progression. This is what a 50% reduction in rate would look like. And so what I really wanna show you here is, is how much this translates over time, not necessarily today, next week, or next month. So where the blue line becomes orange is where quality of life goes from good to fair. Let's call that our threshold. The goal is to keep everybody below 1,000 in the green and blue zones. I want all of my patients saying my quality of life is good or excellent. So if you do nothing, if you just plot along like a typical average patient with Parkinson's disease, our data suggests that the average person gets about 10 good years of quality of life with Parkinson's disease. If one is able to reduce their symptoms and maintain that benefit as the disease progresses, that translates to approximately 17 good years with Parkinson's. Alternatively, if we don't do anything to treat your symptoms, but we just slow the rate of progression by 50%, you might not notice it early on, but what that translates to is more than 20 good years, about 23 good quality of life years with Parkinson's disease. One more thing I wanna point out before we move on is if you are talking about a symptomatic therapy, you take levodopa for your tremor, you immediately know whether it's working or not. Within the first month, you are clear it helps or it doesn't. When we look at the figure to the right, for those first couple years after making the change, it's not really clear whether it's working or not. The benefit becomes more apparent over time. And this is both a problem for patients who are trying to get some feedback 
I'm doing all this stuff. Is it helping? Is it working? And you don't know because you can't start and stop and feel different. You don't get the symptomatic benefit. You're really having to do this based on faith or, or good judgment or your view of the literature. The other thing I'll point out is this is what makes it so difficult for researchers to study disease modification. Our clinical trials only go out a year, maybe 18 months, and that is the window where it is most difficult to see an improvement if it exists. And so it is not feasible for us to do a double-blind placebo-controlled intervention trial that goes out 10 years. Uh, so we have to cut it short to save money and stuff like that. Um, but I also want to point out how difficult it is for researchers to be able to find disease modifying therapies in those first couple of years. We now know that diagnosis of Parkinson's disease occurs really late. By the time you are told this looks like Parkinson's disease, most of you have had Parkinson's and the degenerative process that goes with it for at least 10 years. Many of you have been dealing with non-motor symptoms, loss of smell, bowel issues, anxiety, apathy, fatigue, depression, erectile dysfunction that have gone undiagnosed. And only when you get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease does it all kind of start to make sense. My research starts at the point of diagnosis forward. When I'm talking to you today about the research, what I wanna make sure that you understand is my, the thing I am most passionate about is not so much what led up to Parkinson's disease, but are there things that people with Parkinson's can do from the point of diagnosis that will shape the slope of that progression? The real true goal here is not just to slow Parkinson's disease progression, but to get to people who have Parkinson's disease before they develop motor symptoms. During the first 10, 20 years of this disease, if we can identify people with early Parkinsonism before the motor symptoms kick in and initiate some of those disease modifying therapies, then we could truly be opening the door to prevention. That's what I am most excited about. So, Epidemiology is the study of populations, and most of the epidemiologic research that has been done in Parkinson's disease to date has been something called traditional epidemiology. What are the things that people are doing in midlife that increases or decreases the risk of being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? We have a dozen or so studies that say, you know, the more dairy, red meat, pork, fried food, processed foods, sweets, desserts, a person eats, the more pesticides they're exposed to, the more likely they are to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Similarly, the more fresh fruits and vegetables and exercise you do, the less likely you are to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's. That's great if the goal is to prevent people from being diagnosed, but you are here today because you've already been diagnosed and you want to know does anything I do change the outcomes over time? And that is called clinical epidemiology. And there has been very little research in clinical epidemiology in the field of Parkinson's disease. Very briefly, I said there are a handful of studies that say dairy increases risk of Parkinson's. The whole study I'm about to talk to you about really came about because so many of my patients were coming to me saying, well, does that mean I should stop eating dairy? And the honest answer is, there is no evidence or there was no evidence that once you already had Parkinson's, changing your diet would change the rate of progression. And so I started this study to, to answer those types of questions for my patients. Before we dive into the results, I wanna make sure that you understand that association does not mean causation. People who are eating more broccoli and cauliflower and fresh organic fruits and vegetables are probably also more likely to have gym memberships. You know, people who are exercising seven days a week are probably have less apathy. And so we are not at a stage where we can say A cause B. That is not what these research results show. Uh, an example here, pesticides. We know pesticides are associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. What we did in our study is we asked patients, true or false, I try to eat organically grown foods when possible. People who said true to that statement were less symptomatic than people who said false. Does that mean that organic foods will decrease symptom severity? Not necessarily. And, and I'll just say here, 
the statement was not, I always eat organic, right? Some people can't afford it. Sometimes it's not accessible. I very intentionally chose the wording. I try when possible. That's all we're asking you to do. Try when possible. I am not saying that every single thing you put in your mouth has to be organic. I'm saying when it's you're in a position to avoid foods that have been sprayed with pesticides, you should probably try to do that. So what you all really want to know are, are there things that you can eat that slow Parkinson's rate of progression? One more thing I want to say about study design before I dive into this. Most of the research that has happened in the Parkinson's community to date is efficacy research. Um, we try to get the same type of people in the same age group so that they are as identical as possible. And the only thing that differs between the people in the study are the red pill or the blue pill. And at the end of the day, that allows us to make some very firm conclusions about the red pill versus the blue pill. This is an ideal study if we are trying to understand mechanism of action. Conversely, I am more interested in effectiveness research. And what I want to know is, are there therapies that are in a real world environment going to translate to clinically relevant improvements for the patients in the, in the general population? Those are pragmatic goals instead of explanative goals. A great example of this is Lyme's for scurvy. We had 3 million people died of scurvy before we started using limes to treat and cure scurvy. For 200 years, we treated scurvy with limes and then we discovered ascorbic acid, vitamin C. What I'm trying to do is bring you the limes. Somebody else can figure out ascor whether it's ascorbic acid or the molecule or what it is on the bad foods that's harmful or what it is in the good foods that's protective, that's not really my area of interest or my research focus. What I'm looking for are the real world things that real patients can do today that will lead to improved outcomes, whether or not I understand the mechanism of action behind it. So very briefly, uh, the research approach that I took is something called a positive deviance model. Um, those green dots on the figure are all real people with Parkinson's disease, and the blue line through the center represents the average rate of Parkinson's disease progression. Very simply, I'm using the diversity in this community to my statistical advantage. I'm looking at the people doing unusually well and trying to figure out what are they doing, looking at the people doing unusually poorly, trying to figure out what they're doing, and I'm statistically comparing the two groups. The way I am rating Parkinson's disease severity is something called the PROPD. It's a freely available outcome measure that I built for the purposes of this study. And what we ask study participants to do is um, rate the severity of their 33 different symptoms on average over the last week. Um, in the middle, you can kind of see the longitudinal slope of Parkinson's disease progression. That's kind of the anticipated expected rate of change. We are still looking for study participants, uh, anybody who has 90 minutes twice a year to spare and has access to the internet. We would tremendously appreciate if you would consider joining this study. Um, and the last thing I want to say before I get into the real meat, pun intended, of this presentation is that I don't expect you to like what I'm about to say. You may not like the taste of the medicine. Whether or not this is acceptable to you, appealing to you, seems doable to you is very different than whether or not it works. I also wanna say that psychologically, there's a whole bunch wrapped up behind food. We don't just eat to feel full. We eat when we're happy, when we're sad, as part of ceremony and culture and community. Um, a neurologist here in Seattle said to me once, my patients have lost so much, I'm not going to take away their cheeseburgers and milkshakes too. I think that's very disempowering. I don't think it's their decision. I think the physician's job is to give the patient the data, the information, and let the patient decide what they are up for. 
I was with a psychiatrist in Parkinson's disease specialist last week who said to me that they were recently referred a patient for anxiety. And when they sat the patient down, they learned the only thing this patient was anxious about were all these food restrictions their movement disorder doc had given them. So, you know, I've had patients say to me, I would rather spend the rest of my life in this wheelchair than give up ice cream. I've had other patients say, hey, listen, no problem. If there's a chance this could help and this can hurt, just say the word, I'm done. That's what I'll eat from now on. Some people go kicking and screaming. Some people do, are a little more analytical, what makes sense, what doesn't. Some people are creatures of habit. Some people just don't have the community support to make some of the changes. That's all okay. And this is all part of management, managing Parkinson's disease and lifestyle modification. Malnutrition is tremendously common in Parkinson's disease. And we don't work it up. We don't have people who specialize in Parkinson's disease malnutrition. It kind of falls through the cracks. Dietitians aren't terribly well informed about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's doctors aren't terribly well informed about malnutrition. Um, but what we see is that people with Parkinson's who are malnourished are more likely to have anxiety, depression, constipation, cognitive impairment, and dystonia. This is the natural therapies uh, heading. There is nothing more potent in terms of things associated with better outcomes over time than exercise and friendships. People who are exercising 30 minutes a day, seven days a week are doing better than people who do 30 minutes of exercise six days a week. Six is better than five, five is better than four, and the first two days seem to not make much of a difference at all. People who say, true, I have a lot of friends are statistically doing better than people who said false. And conversely, people who say, I have a lot of stress and I am lonely are doing having more Parkinson's symptoms over time than people who are not stressed and are not lonely. What we don't know is whether or not that can become a therapy. Can we take a person with Parkinson's disease who may not be doing very well and teach them stress management techniques, help them figure out ways to minimize the stress in their life and get them some friends? Can that translate to something therapeutic? I don't know. That's the research that's called an intervention trial, and that's what needs to come next. And there are some simple activities that might feed two of those goals in the same swoop, right? Exercise with friends. Now you have friends and exercise. It took the same amount of time, but you checked two things off the list. I'm trying to make it so that it is easy and fun for you to adopt healthy lifestyle. Okay. So what many of you want to hear, are there foods associated with better outcomes over time? According to our first published data in 2017, the answer is yes. Fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, olive oil, coconut oil, wine, fresh herbs and spices were all associated with better outcomes over time. Conversely, the more canned stuff people ate, canned fruits, canned vegetables, fried foods, beef, ice cream, yogurt, and cheese were all associated with worse, statistically worse Parkinson's outcomes over time. All of these results were adjusted for age, gender, income, and years since diagnosis. We have done that same type of analysis, but with an updated data set. Now we have 2,900 people in the data set. And what we did is we looked at everybody through 2021 who had joined the study. For this figure, I have left the bad stuff off. I want you to not worry so much about the quote unquote bad foods that I want you to avoid. I see too many people avoiding the bad foods but still not getting enough of the good ones. What I would like to do is have you leave here today determined to prioritize more good. Rather than take things away from you, rather than be restrictive, I would like you to focus on, can I find a way to get a few more fresh vegetables into my diet? Brown rice, fresh fruit, coconut oil, olive oil, nuts and seeds, eggs, fresh herbs and spices, oats, wine, non-fried fish, and green tea were the foods that the people who are doing the best say that they are eating the most of. It's not just about what you eat, but how you eat. We see that people who are doing the best tend to say true to the following statements. 
I avoid soda. I regularly eat buckwheat. I avoid dairy. I regularly eat farro. I avoid artificial colors or sweeteners. I avoid beef. I only consume gluten-free bread and bread products. I avoid artificial colors and flavors. I routinely prepare meals for others. I try to eat organically grown foods when possible. I am a vegetarian. I regularly eat quinoa. I avoid pork and I use spices liberally. I do not believe that every one of you needs to say true to all of those things. I don't think that every single person with Parkinson's needs to give up all gluten containing foods. I just want to let you know that the people who are doing best were more likely to say true to these statements. Do I think buckwheat is the cure for Parkinson's disease? Absolutely not. Do I think that ancient grains like buckwheat and farro and quinoa might contain certain fibers that help feed good healthy probiotics in our gut that subsequently decrease intestinal inflammation and improve overall health? Maybe. Again, that's the difference between the pragmatic and the explanative. What we don't know is how this translates over time. Most of the people in our study, that solid blue line is the data that we are pretty confident about. We can say with 95% confidence that this is the mean rate of Parkinson's progression in our cohort. Um, what we don't know is for those of you who are planning on living a lot more than 10 years, what happens in the long term? How, and, and what we really know is that it's not going to be all about diet. There are a whole bunch of things that come into play when we are talking about slowing or accelerating Parkinson's progression. What we're trying, what we need to do is once we identify the variables associated with the best outcomes over time, what we want to know is can we package those? Can we deliver them? Can we teach people with Parkinson's to do the stuff in the blue circle? And will that translate to a reduction in slope over time? My personal goal, my personal hope is that we can figure out how to slow the slope of progression enough that a 50 year old diagnosed with Parkinson's disease can live 50 more years with Parkinson's disease and still each step of the way call their quality of life good or excellent. That's my goal for all of my patients and my public health aspirations. There are, before we talk about supplements, um, there are a couple nutrition-based strategies for making Parkinson's disease more effective that I just want to touch on because they're so important. Uh, the first one is protein redistribution diets. If you are on levodopa, and it is your experience that your morning pills work better than your evening pills, or that sometimes your meds work and sometimes they don't, one of the most common reasons for that is because dietary protein is getting in the way of your medication working well. A trick for that is not to limit the amount of protein that you eat, but to save your protein for dinner. If you have a low protein breakfast and a low protein lunch, so levodopa and dietary protein use the same receptors inside your intestinal tract. So if you can save dietary protein for dinner, what that does is it kind of clears the way for your meds to have first dibs throughout the day, making your medication more effective. Um, there is a little bit of research that suggests that some people with Parkinson's, uh, especially elderly folks, may not make enough stomach acid to kick these meds in and activate them on a in a timely manner. Uh, one study was done using a powdered vitamin C Another study was done using a lemon's worth of lemon juice, and both of them showed that for a subset of people with Parkinson's, the addition, taking your levodopa with a weak acid like vitamin C or lemon juice actually enhances the amount of levodopa available to your body. Another trick that is not used nearly enough is there is a dietary supplement. It's over the counter here in the United States. It's a prescription drug in other places. But here in the U.S., it's a fairly inexpensive over-the-counter supplement called CDP choline or citicoline. And there are a good, let's say, six studies now that have shown that if a patient with Parkinson's on levodopa adds CDP choline, that that can make the current dose of levodopa 30 to 50 percent more effective. The drug is stronger and lasts longer. Think of it as sort of like a natural entacapone sort of thing. 
So it tends to be safe. It's not very expensive. Um, this more than the other supplements should be considered a symptomatic therapy. Uh, this is one that I actually would like you to get the okay from your healthcare provider before you start, because it actually works so well that most patients a month after starting it need to adjust their medication. So if you are going to start this, please get the approval of your doc. And in an ideal world, you would start it one month after before your next visit with your neurologist so that if your meds do need adjusting, they can help you with that at your next visit. So supplements, I don't need to tell any of you how sup, uh, popular supplements are. This is predicted to be a $40 billion industry by 2026. And just within our own community, about up as many as 58% of people with Parkinson's are already using some dietary supplements. Most of your doctors are not providing much counseling on this. And a lot of you are doing it based on information that you get off the internet and from friends. So what we did is in our survey, we are only looking at people who responded to the survey in 2021. There were 1,089 people who responded to our survey. And this is a list of supplements that were associated with better outcomes over time. There were a long list of supplements that were not associated with improved outcomes that will all be discussed in the manuscript. Um, but right now, uh, I just want to show you the list of 13 supplements that were associated with the best outcomes over time. I cannot say this any more clearly. I am not suggesting that all of you go home and start all these things. Some of them are expensive. Some of them come with risks. Some of them have contraindications. If you have had breast cancer or prostate cancer and you start DHEA, you could be hurting yourself. Um, some of these are only for people probably who are low. And if you haven't had a test, you don't know if you need it. So I'm going to talk to you about each of these supplements, but I, I really want to say this is not a to-do list. This is just to get your wheels turning to let you know that for 200 years, we have not been able to come up with a pharmaceutical drug able to slow Parkinson's disease progression. And we just surveyed thousand people and we have 13 that are coming up as associated with slowing Parkinson's, slower Parkinson's progression over time. Like I said, I don't know that the slowed progression has anything to do with these supplements. It could be that people who are taking ginkgo are also more likely to have gym memberships and be working with a movement disorders specialist instead of a primary care provider for their Parkinson's. There are a lot of things that supplement takers may be doing above and beyond the supplements. We can't say that the supplements are responsible for the improved outcomes. But if you met me in an elevator and said, oh, I have Parkinson's disease. Are there any supplements I should consider? This is the list. These are the supplements that were statistically significantly associated with fewer symptoms over time. Ginkgo, NAD, biologically active form of folate, oral glutathione, macuna, coenzyme Q10, curcumin, low-dose lithium, homocysteine-lowering B vitamins, DHEA, coconut oil, vitamin C, and fish oil. Again, just because it was on that list doesn't mean you should start taking it. What I am suggesting uh, is that these are the supplements that you and your doc might consider, that you and your naturopathic physician or your movement disorder spe specialist talk to. Um, and really, my hope is that somebody else will come behind me and design some intervention trials to see, can we give people these supplements, one or some combination of them, and actually slow Parkinson's progression? So to wrap this up, I just want to say, you know, we are looking so simply at the people doing best and the people doing worst. And what each of you are going to do, have to do is figure out one, where is the starting point? Are you 50 or are you 90? Are you doing better than average or are you doing worse than average? What kind of shape do you want to be in on your 100th birthday? I have patients who will tell me I want to be in the excellent zone until I'm 110. I have other patients who say, if I live till 60 and I have, and I'm a little bit better than average, that's good enough. 
All I'm trying to communicate to you today is that you have options. There are way more tools in the toolbox than I think most people appreciate. Just like you are aware of the 15 different pharmaceutical drugs available to people with Parkinson's disease, a couple different forms of brain surgery available to people with Parkinson's disease, I would like you to walk away from today's talk realizing that there are tools you haven't even begun to learn about or learn how to use or to mess around with. What I am encouraging you to do is just become a little bit more well-informed. Don't judge it. Just try to make yourself a little bit healthier today than you were yesterday. Probably every once a month or so, somebody will come into my office and say, listen, I'm back to have you tell me everything you said last year, but now I'm ready to hear it. That's fine. If the only thing that happens with today's talk is I've planted a seed and given you something to think about, great. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I look forward to answering questions in a little bit. Thank you.